I haven't done this presentation before. I'm in the habit of just rolling out the same old jam presentations. You know, this is how you write a paper, this is what you need to do, this, this is the guidance. I'm going to do something that I haven't done before. I'm going to talk about what I think is the future of scholarly writing within the sort of publishing sphere. Um, I know this is bad, Wiley, Jan, and Nursing Open. These are my own, uh, these are my own uh, thoughts. That they, you know, they don't belong. To the, 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 I'll take responsibility for these, for these ideas myself. And the ideas I'm going to talk about today in the next half hour or so, I've tried to get them published in the Times Higher. They wouldn't take it. They thought this was, uh, they thought I'd gone mad, I think. And uh, 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 the, the other um, journal that we have through Wiley, which is called uh, Nurse Author and Editor, they wouldn't take it either. So I did a blog about it, sent it out to lots of people for comments. I didn't get that many comments. Uh, I'd be very interested to, know, to, to hear what, what you think about what I'm going to say. So as I say, I've not done this before, and I just wanted to run through what I think is where academic publishing is heading. And I think if we don't take some of these things into account, we might get there without realising we've got there, and the whole thing might have changed a lot. And what I've been, what I've so seen in the 25 years I've been involved in academic publishing is that really, I mean, I wasn't involved in the days of the proceedings of the Royal Academy being set up, but say the Royal Society being set up. But you know, the whole thing has changed beyond recognition, not just since the uh, proceedings of the Royal Society, but since 25 years ago, you know, when everything arrived and uh, at the end of the week in a big in a big box, all the manuscripts came in, and you you worked on these and you sent them back in a big box and this kind of thing. You submitted things in hard copy, triplicate, and all the, all the rest of it. And so many other things have, have grown up, like cope, the equator guidelines. You know, there's, there's just you know we're hemmed in quite rightly and quite nicely by lots of publishing guidelines. So there's been a huge change in what's going on in publishing over over the last. Uh, 20, 20, 20 years or so, and maybe even in the last 10 years or so, things have moved. But I think the essential model of writing long manuscripts, 5,000 words or so, uh, submitting it, having it peer-reviewed, edited, and publication still persists. Uh, and and I, I think that model uh, is going to change. I think it's got to change. And it is changing. And I think the publishing industry has got to catch up with this, and I think scholars have to catch up with it as well. You may not like the way it's going, but I just don't know how for how much longer the model that we're operating now is, is going to last. And that's the model of, you know, me getting up at sort of half past six in the morning, going to my computer for seven o'clock with a cup of tea, opening up to see what manuscripts have come in, great long ones, deciding what's going to go forward, what's not going to go forward, you know, sending a few forward for review, grinding through this process of peer review, eventually coming back, sometimes rejected, sometimes accepted, sometimes for, well, really accepted, usually for revision. You know, and the, the, this, this, this sort of lengthy model. I notice checks and balances built in, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have those built in, but I just think the model's creaking a little, a little bit. Some aspects of academic publishing have changed in the last 20 years, but basically what they've done is perpetuated what I would say is the traditional model. You know, we're, we've got the internet, we've got um, social media, we've got you know, all sorts of possibilities now, got the ethical guidelines and all the rest of it, but really what it's doing is propping up and shoring up a model that's been there ever since the proceedings of the Royal Society were, were uh, brought into being the first ever academic journal. So I, I, I don't think they've really changed things much. It's still based on, as I said before, lengthy manuscripts that are peer-reviewed, either published or rejected after, after amendment. That hasn't, that hasn't essentially changed, and I think it really is this bottom bit that probably is changing, and you're probably aware of some of these things already, but taken together I think they pose a, not a threat, but a big challenge to the way we're doing things at the moment. And, and of course the papers then go through the same process repeatedly until they eventually get accepted, you know, they may get rejected by one journal and go on to another one, another one, another one. And I'm not complaining about this model because I've, I've benefited greatly from it and I know how to play the game with this model and I get published uh, fairly regularly and look around the room and see colleagues who do, who do likewise. It's not, it's not a bad model, as I say, I think it's, it's going to change. I think the problems are that we are expected to write very lengthy manuscripts. And we see this as scholarship writing long things that mostly don't get read, let's be frank about it. Ret it. You know, we've got all these checks and balances, we've got publication standards, ethical standards, yet the number of retracted papers, for all sorts of reasons, continues to increase. I don't have a figure for that, but all you need to do is sign up for Retraction Watch, 
and you'll get a daily, sometimes several times a day, an email tells you about the papers that are being retracted or go to the website for retraction watch. It's, 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 it's legion. And it isn't just in low-grade journals. There are papers coming out in Nature and Science and PNAS and the New England Journal of Medicine and, of course, famously, The Lancet, being retracted for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes scientific problems, sometimes ethical problems, sometimes, well, that, 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 that really covers it. So we're not really getting much better at producing better science, necessarily. Some of it's still dodgy, you might say. Much of the much published work is never read. We, we know this in, in the publishing industry. If citations are anything to go by, they don't necessarily mean that something hasn't been read or has been read. But if citations are anything to go by, every journal, from Journal of Advanced Nursing through to Nature and The Lancet, they all have a tale of papers that are never, ever cited, which suggests that they're never, ever read. If they are read, they're not found to be useful. We write extensive introductions and discussions to our papers. As I said, for some reason I put here they don't interest the public. P to be honest, on the whole, I don't know, I'm not looking about for anybody to put their hands up to see whether these things do or do not interest them. I don't think they interest many academics, to be honest. When I, when I, maybe this is just me, but when I read a paper, I look for two things. What have they found out? What are the results? And if I'm interested in the methods, I'll look at the methods. And very often I'm reading a paper purely for the methods in something that I'm interested in, item response theory, for example. And I'm not worried what they found out. I just want to see how they did it and how they handled the data. So I think we're, I think we're producing these large pieces of work that aren't really of much interest out there. I think discussions and introductions are probably more useful for reviewers to see if the person knows what they're talking about rather than as, a, as something that should necessarily be published. That may be a little bit controversial. If we've got time, you can tell me. Now, you may think, as an editor, I'm just <laughs> praying for Thanksgiving, I've just been in the States, or, to, or, or for praying for Christmas. I'm not really, and I'll come to the end. We won't have time to discuss the role of the editor much, but at the end of it, I'll, I'll, I'll raise the, what, what does this mean for, for editors. So, I think the improved processes, the things that we've, we've seen, you know, the internet and the World Wide Web, there have been significant influences on the academic publishing industry. These have really speeded things up. They've made publishing much easier. They've made it much more accessible. The links make it much easier to put things out on social media, which, of course, didn't exist before the, before the internet. So, as I say, they've mostly been speeding things up and automating processes rather than changing the way we do things. So what are the things that are around that might change things? The new processes, I think, that, that are around, all things that we'll be familiar with, and I think it's the sum total of these things that makes the difference, data repositories. Again, this didn't exist years ago. We, we guarded our data jealously. You know, would you like to share your data? Not in your, not in your million, not letting anybody see my data in case they do something with it. Like what? Ethical committees, you know, you have to destroy your data within a certain period and all the rest. That's all changed now. It seems a virtue now to keep your data, to make it available publicly, and to share it. So we, so the data's up, you know. So I'll come back to why I think this is a, an issue in a minute. Supplementary material that that didn't exist before the internet. But that is a that is a useful change. It means you can write shorter papers, you can supplement, or you can you can write essentially longer papers, but shorter than they than they would otherwise be at the front end with material that's uh, supplementing it, either other data or uh, just links or videos or any, anything that boosts your <coughs> paper a little bit. Study registration. This is this is relatively new. But uh, clinical trials registration, and I will, we'll come back to that. that, that's relatively new. It's compulsory now under the, for those of us who are signed up to the All Trials campaign, for example, for a randomised control trial to be registered. But we're trying to encourage people to register all sorts of trials. And now Prospero, which I think is run from the University of York, for registering systematic reviews. And I think these things will, will spread. Preprints. I was just dealing, I, I'm also an editor of the Wiki Journal of Medicine. I was dealing with preprints this morning. They're much, much more common, becoming more common. They're controversial, but COPE has brought out a statement about them. And post publication review, which means publication, and you know, then you get it reviewed. And finally, not finally, Wikipedia. I'll come to why I think that's uh, 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 making, making a difference. I had a little titter of laughter there. Who did that? I'm a, huge, I'm a huge fan of Wikipedia. Uh, and The Conversation, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. And I think, the, I think these, these things at the end, really, well, what's this about? But hopefully I can, hopefully I can explain in the, in the next uh, 
10, 15 minutes. Well, data repositories, to me, this, this does away with this need to describe things at length in papers, you know. Uh, how much description do we need in a paper when it can just be put up on a repository and somebody can look at it? Okay, you may say that's the raw data, but you know, you can use metadata to describe it. If you're putting things up there, you can, you can give a summary, you can give the demographics, you can give the number of males, the number of females, you know, you can give the, the basics. And because the data are available, if somebody else wants to do something with them and check it, which is one of the virtues of putting it up there, they can do it. So I think, I think data to repositories you know, are a place where, where the data is available. You know, so as, as, as I say, I just think we, we probably don't need some of these lengthy explanations in papers. We can point people to the data plus some metadata that could be available for, for everyone to look at. Uh, supplementary material does some of the, some of the same things, uh, in, in, in my view. Raises the same questions as data repositories in a way because you're making things available that people can get access to and can look at that you don't need to explain at length in, in the paper. Uh, they're very, very handy. There's some overlap, of course, between supplementary material and, and data repositories. But these things are being used much, much more often now uh, by, by, by authors. Data repositories are either run by the journals or run by universities or run by research organisations. But essentially, as I say, data is much more available than it used to be. So there's no need really for appendices to papers. We just put it online and it can be linked to a lot more papers than one. It doesn't have to just be linked to one. So, for example, if you're doing several papers out of one big database, you can make the database available and just publish the front end in, in some way. Study registration. I think this is changing things as well. I think, to, I, I'm asking the question, but I mean, of course, I'm, I'm saying, I think it's obvious the need for design and methods sections of most articles that we write, because it's on the, on the uh, study registration site. If you're doing a randomised control trial, the design should be explained there, the randomization should be explained there, your primary outcome should be explained. And for few people do it, you should actually go back to the registration site and register your results. Very few people do it if you look at the, uh, at the, at the, at the registration sites. But in fact, just to a large extent, okay, un unrefereed, unreviewed, but to a large extent, most of what you need out of the paper is up on the study registration sites. I'm beginning to question, really, why we need to write the papers in the first place, you know. There are ways in which it could be refereed. So there's the, you know, the data registries, there's the Prospero, which is run, run through York. Uh, incidentally, I don't know if anybody's used Prospero, it seems to like only clinical outcome studies. It's not very keen on other kinds of studies, although I do see some up there. But I think we probably need to extend that a little bit to other kinds of, of, of reviews as well. So prosperous for registering systematic reviews as opposed, to, as opposed to clinical trials. But people often don't realise that on, on trial registries, it doesn't have to be a clinical trial. You can register all sorts of studies on there, including surveys and quasi-experiments as well. Of course, the pressure for this is increasing, and not just the pressure to do it per se, but to do it completely and have all the de details available publicly on these all-trial sites. Ben Goldacre has driven this forward, a real single-man uh, you know, single campaign, which has a huge effect across the world. And most major publishers like Wiley, Elsevier, Sage, Springer, all these ones, they're all signed up to the all-trials all campaign. Authors are only kind of catching up with it, but we're now... We've gone through a process of telling people they should do it, to giving people the opportunity, if you haven't done it, but you should do it now, to now, I think, from the beginning of next year, certainly on, on my journal, it will be, if you haven't registered it before, I'm, you will not be able to publish that, that trial. So that will, that will lever things up a bit, it will accelerate the process, it will encourage people to do it. Uh, and of course there's clinical trials uh, uh, sites as well. That's the most common one, which is in the States. There's also a European one. I don't know how much longer we'll be able to use that one. But say, uh, there's actually, as far as I know, there's not a major UK one. But this is the one that most people use. Your university has to be signed up to. So there's, there's, I'm just saying that there's a, there's a lot of pressure and, uh, uh, to do these things and to register the trials. And there's a lot of information available on these sites. And again, the pressure is on all the time to get much more information out there. Uh, as I say, just raising the question to me as to why we need to publish clinical trials in quite the way we do. The issue of preprints, I don't know if people are aware of, of the preprint movement. Preprints are essentially an area where you can put a paper up 
before it's gone to a journal, and you can get comments on it. So essentially, it's, it's you could say it's either pre or post publication review, or it's really post publication review because you've kind of published it, and you can gather comments on the paper, and then you can alter the paper as a result of that, and then submit it to a journal. Now, most journals at one time uh, were very much against this. You know, that, oof, it's already on the public domain and whatever, we can't do that. But actually, it's now being seen as more of a virtue. COPE seems to be, the Committee on Publication Ethics, seems to be quite happy with that. And certainly, major publishers say, OK, if you're not there's a preprint, and then it comes to our journal, we'll, we'll accept it. I think the preprint probably has to then be taken down. Uh, I'm not very, not very sure about that, because I've never actually used the preprint process myself. But uh, you know, people can do this. Themselves. They can do it on preprint sites, or they can do it on their own website. They can do it on a university repository. There's all sorts of ways of doing it. But this is a, this is a fundamental change. This is this is a real change, I think, and a real challenge to the peer reviewing process as we operate it now, which is pre-publication. Everything's below below the table. Nobody sees what's happened until it's actually published. Only reviewers see it. And you know, th th there's been a lot of criticism of that system. The British Parliament about five years ago did a major report on, on peer reviewing, major investigation. It took a couple of years to do. It's all available online. You can watch the televised proceedings if you've got enough time to do it. But there's a major report published by the House of Commons. And the conclusion they came to was that the peer review process was an appalling process, but actually it was the only one that we could use. It was the best one we had. They looked at peer review of articles peer review of grants, peer review of all sorts of things. Peer review is, uh, is but here to stay, but the way it's being operated now is it's changing. And as I say, I think with COPE giving a sort of green light to preprints with one or two provisos, I think we're going to see a lot more of, a lot more of this. And that really is going to start to question, why do we need this sort of secretive, blind peer reviewing process that we have at the moment? And, of course, that is linked to the post-publication review issue as well. Uh, much, much the same issue. Reviewing itself is changing. We operate in my journal, double-blind peer review system. Most journals do, but journals like BMC, um, all the BMC suite of journals, I think the PLOS ones as well, operate an open peer reviewing system, whereby it's not blinded. The author knows who the reviewer is, and the reviewer knows who the author is. You know, there's, there's, there's pluses and minuses, but that's, a, that's another fundamental change to the reviewing system. And it's supposed to engender better practice. It has, it has led to some poor practice uh, on some occasions, on a famous case where uh, gender was identified and some comment was made about gender, but uh, that review didn't review much longer for that journal. But that's a fundamental change. And also, the reviews are published as well uh, under the BMC system. So if you review for BMC journals, not only uh, does the author know who you are, they, they can see the review. And I don't know how many people realise this, you can actually look at the reviewing processes. It's very, very interesting and very useful. And whenever people ask me, I'm straying a little bit now from my main point, but when people ask me, how do I learn about reviewing? Have a look on the BMC site and have a look at the reviews. You know, they're, they're very, very helpful. So anyway, the whole issue, the whole way things are being reviewed is, is, is changing. So I'm just wondering, you know, with, 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 with this inception of post-publication review, in other words, publicly review once things are in the public domain, I'm wondering how much longer we need to persist with uh, the pre-publication peer review. I'm just wondering if that will, I'm not saying we shouldn't, I'm just wondering how much longer, I'm wondering how much longer academics will, will tolerate it, basically, because it's a huge hold-up to getting information out. And just yesterday, um, I can't remember which organisation it was, it might have, one of the big research councils gave permission for results to be published quickly uh, when it's dealing with emergency situations like Ebola. So it's, it's almost becoming instituted as this. And I think this, this is probably one of the pivotal points for the way uh, scholarship and, pub and publications is changing. Then there's the, the dreaded Wikipedia, which I love. Wiki I don't know how many of you do any work with Wikipedia or have a Wikipedia page. Wikipedia is actually... Not what people think it is. It's much more rigorous and much more uh, peer-reviewed and really very, very finely and strictly edited, uh, much more so than most people realise. If you try to make changes to a website, you've got to justify why you've done it. You've got to put a comment in as to why you've done it. You've got to provide a, a, a verifiable reference, for example. And if you don't, the editors will just come back and change it back again. So it's not so easy to do things in Wikipedia. And the Wikimedia... Foundation, which runs Wikipedia 
also runs various journals, one of which is the Wiki Journal of Medicine, which I'm on the editorial board of. And that operates a completely different system. It operates preprint, post-publication review, and it's diamond access. No money changes hands at any point. You don't pay to have it published, nobody pays to view it. The whole thing's run by people giving money to the Wikimedia Foundation. So that's a, that's a fundamental challenge, not just to the traditional model of publication, but to the open access model of publication, which is causing us all sorts of problems at the moment with predatory publishing and all the rest of it. And now this issue in Europe with the Plan S or whatever it is, Plan something or other, which is going to basically stop people from publishing in hybrid journals like Jan. Uh, they're not going to allow that anymore. The Gates Foundation has stopped funding work that will be published in journals like mine, because it's a hybrid journal. So there's a whole lot of changes going on. So these are the sort of things I think are going to have to leave of the publication industry to think. Okay, so... And the conversation. Again, I don't know how many people have read the conversation or used the conversation. Very high standards. I've been published in it a few times. It's a succinct, accurate, sourced pieces of, of, of writing. Okay, sometimes there are political things in there, opinions. That, that's fine. But it's always clear if it's somebody expressing an opinion. But there are summaries of scientific fields or sometimes summaries of scientific papers in there which are really short, very readable for the general public. And I think it gives us a model for putting stuff out at the front end, which people will actually read, and which is actually rigorous. I know from trying to publish scientific work in it, just how rigorous the editors are. They know what they're talking about when it comes to t statistics. And so, we've got all this going on around. We've got trial registration, data repositories, supplementary material, post-publication review, the end's fallen off there, wiki stuff, and preprints. And I, I, I think... These are, these are all challenges to the way that we're publishing at the moment. And I think these could all be there in, in existence and places where we put our data, where we do the reviewing process, all very different from the way we do things at the moment. And at the centre, I'm not suggesting it should be the conversation, but I think in the centre, possibly we could have a conversation-type piece that pulls it all together that people will actually read and cite and use as opposed to the mountains of stuff that doesn't get used at the moment or even read. So I think, I think that's the sort of model I'm envisaging we might be moving towards. But there are issues, of course. Everybody really, oh, what about issues? How do we do? What about? So how do we measure impact? Okay, that's a big thing at the moment. I don't mean impact of the research. I mean impact in terms of citations. Because at the moment we've got uh, Thomson Reuters, which is now Clarivate, which runs the impact factor. And that's the gold standard measure of how well a journal's doing, the number of citations to the number of papers it publishes. But we've also got Scopus snapping away at its heels, producing its own set of metrics, its um, eigenvalues and, and its own itch indices and things like that. And of course, more recently, we've got the alt metrics, which are measuring social media measures of papers. So they'll measure the number of times a paper is mentioned on Twitter, the number of times it's on LinkedIn, the number of times it's on blog or the number of times it's in a national newspaper online and the weightings are, the weightings for these things Twitter gets one point, LinkedIn gets half a point I think a national newspaper gets two points a blog gets one point so it means things that are more influential in reaching a wider audience get a bigger or metric score so it's not beyond, not beyond the bounds of possibility that we could see some sort of combined score I'm sure we're going to get to a point where this is going to become less important and everybody will breathe a huge sigh of relief when the impact factor becomes less important and these things are brought into account. So I don't think it's beyond the bounds of possibility that we can measure at least readership and usage impact, if not the actual impact of the research. The other issues is, is there really a role for people like me and for publishers? And I think that depends on us. It depends on whether we want to be dinosaurs and do things the way they've always been done. And I have to say that whenever I've talked to people informally about this, or tried to get it published, or put out a blog and got comments about it, that really that's all I'm seeing. You know, oh, we can't, we can't change. It'll never change. We can't change because this is the model that works. Well. You know, this is the one we rely, we rely on and we, we trust it and all the rest of it. I'm not sure how we trust it with all these retractions and things that are going on. I don't trust it quite so much as I used to do, although I try to do the best I can for my own papers and my own journal. Or are we going to get fit and...
try and embrace this new system and make it work for us. Nobody can do it alone, but I'm pretty sure the publishers are all watching each other and waiting. Who's going to go first? Publishers like to be thought of as being at the front, but they don't like to actually put themselves there in case they get it wrong. Uh, but I'm, you know, as I say, I'm just repeating myself now, but I'm quite sure that the model is going to, going to change. So, I'll finish there. You can have, ask me some questions if you want. This is a publication that I always push every time I do talks these days. It's, uh, it is a Wiley, instituted by Wiley. It's now run by Inane, edited by, by Leslie Nicholl, and it's the North Southern editor. It's a website, and it's free. You know, all you have to do is you can, you can register to get, to get emails, but you can actually just go to the website now, North Southern editor, and read the articles. Anybody interested in publication, any aspect of publication, ethics, metrics, the conversation, whatever, there are articles in there, some of, them, some of them written by myself, but, but people can write for this as well. And I think this is a really another very useful resource. If you're too shy to ask questions now, you can ask me after by email or you can follow me uh, on uh, Twitter or WeChat or whatever you want to follow me on. Thanks very much. <laughs>